We are honored to have with us Master Gardener Tish Russell. Is that how you pronounce it? Right, but that's fine. Oh, okay. Don't worry wow. about it. Tish is good. <laughs> Tish is good. Okay, okay. Uh, so we're honored to have Tish, who is a Master Gardener since 2008. And she is here this week during National Garden Week to help the library celebrate with this presentation on butterfly gardening. So please join me in welcoming Tish. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to see so many people here who, who are interested in both gardening and butterflies, because really those two go together. You can't have butterflies without gardens, well, not very easily, and th they just go together, those two. So I'm happy to meet all of you and see you here this evening. Just brief introduction. My name is Tish. Forget the rice they talk. I'm just Tish. And um, if you notice just this very tiny, slight accent, it's because I was born and raised in England, uh, but sensibly made my way to Texas <laughs> and have been here for 30 years. Uh, I am a nurse, or was a nurse in the past, I guess, and a teacher, and ended up teaching for 16 years at San Jacinto College South. And when I retired, then I got into master gardening and a bunch of other things for me, as we do when we retire. I would also like to introduce Judy Anderson. She is also a master gardener. What year was it, Judy? Uh, 2012. 2012. And uh, she chose and planted and got our butterfly garden going down at Carlbide Park, and she maintains it with some help from other people. So she's going to say something after I'm done. And I would li also like to introduce at the back Michelle Thompson, who is one of our interns. We have a very good training program every spring for master gardeners. And when they, they completed the program, then they rotate through various activities to figure out which one they want to do. And so she has been helping us tonight uh, because a Speakers Bureau is one of the things that the Master Gardener Association does. Okay then, we are here to talk about how to establish a garden for butterflies, if you're interested in doing that. And don't feel like that it has to be this major ordeal to make a garden for butterflies. You can do a whole lot. You can do a tiny bit. Anyway, you're going to improve the numbers of the butterflies in your garden. Um, anybody ever wonder the interesting question? I know it was burning in the top of your minds. Why do we call them butterflies? I never did till I read it. I like trivia. The early monks who came to southern England and landed on the shores, we had chalk downs in the south, and this is where I'm from. Masses and masses of what we would call now sulfur butterflies. And they're yellow, and these monks didn't know what to call them. So they said they're the <laughs> color of butter. So they are butterflies. Okay, that's your trivia, but we'll be obsessed. <laughs> All right then, so let's just start thinking about these butterflies. Make sure I'm going in the right direction. This uh, tells you what I'm going to say, and that's what I'm going to say. We're going to go through a basic information about butterflies and then go on to the establishing the garden and some good species. Um, butterfly facts, more little bits of trivia, I guess. Um, they're in the order called Lepidoptera, which is a mouthful, but that's where they, where they are. Um, butterflies and moths are in the same group. Some books say that butterflies don't get going uh, until 65 degrees, that, and in England that would be true probably, but it means that they don't begin to move around. Actually, they need about 80 degrees to get their wings fully spread out and to start um, flying. So th that's why if it's cold or if it's wet or <coughs> overcast, you're not going to see them. It's no good looking for them because they're all hiding under a leaf somewhere. They need a certain amount of warmth. 
Um, they taste with their feet. Now, isn't that cool? They actually <coughs> taste things with their feet. So I thought that was an interesting one. 15,000 to 20,000 species worldwide. I can get my head around a number like that. But Texas has more species than any other states which I think is kind of cool. So <laughs> let's keep them, <laughs> since we got them. Uh, people always ask, what's the difference between a butterfly and moth? And it actually isn't quite as easy. Nothing is as easy as you think to say it. But in general, butterflies are active during the day, and the moths are active at night. But again, that's just a sort of general principle. Um, therefore, butterflies have bright colors. Not much point in having bright colors if you're only out at two in the morning, right? So the moths tend to be duller colors. If you look at the antenna, the butterflies are longer and thinner with a little sort of club thing at the end. The moths tend to be more hairy going all the way up and they're often shorter and stubbier. But that's a very general division of, of the two. Um, there. There's the dull coloration of the, <clears throat> of the moth, and you can barely see the feathery antenna on it. OK, now then. You know, if you're going to attend a talk by a teacher, you're going to get lectured at, okay? <laughs> and if you're going to learn about gardening and butterflies, you've got to know a little bit about butterflies. And lots of you probably do. There is a word called metamorphosis, which means change. And the butterfly species goes through complete metamorphosis. It changes like crazy from one shape to another, and they call that complete metamorphosis. So to understand, we have to jump in the cycle somewhere, and I'm just jumping in with the adult butterfly. And that's why the word mating is up there, because that's where we're starting. An adult butterfly that's hatched out is going to be looking for um, a mate. That's their sort of purpose in life, is to make them lay eggs. And the female is very often larger, and sometimes when they meet, they actually climb on top of each other and fly around like that. So if you see two of them flying around like that, that's what they're up to. You will also see them, two of them, spiraling, going up. And what's happening is, most likely, is that the female is actually trying to get out of the way of the male. Because <laughs> either because she's already mated or because she just doesn't fancy him, okay? <laughs> so they, she'll start going higher and higher and he'll chase her and then so the two of them will go higher and higher and higher until he says, oh, to heck with it, you know, and goes off, finds another bar. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, they attract, they have very bad eyesight for long distance. They can't pick out um, at a distance. So they have to check each other out to find a mate of the same species and to find out whether the butterfly that they found is the opposite sex. And they do it by what are called pheromones, which are chemicals that are secreted out of the, the a lot of insects use this, chemical messengers, you might want to call them. And That's what it means. So that's how they attract each other. And the other thing about butterfly sight, they can't see very far, but they do see an ultraviolet, which means that they can see way more colors than we can, which must be really cool when you think about it. They're not just seeing the colors that we see, they actually see the ultraviolet colors as well. So the world looks very different, I think, to a butterfly than it does to us. So when they have actually done all this chemical scenting and actually found the right species and the opposite sex, then they will mate, obviously, and then the female will go off and lay her eggs. Uh, and very often it is plant-specific. Not with all butterflies, and the classic one we know is the monarch, right? 
the, the, the females are looking for a specific plant. So the monarchs are looking for the, um, the butterfly weed, the milkweed, and so forth. And when, so they've got to find that right plant first. And in general, they will lay eggs on the underneath of the leaf. Now, it, that's, nothing is total, right? You may find one that lays on the top. But as a general principle, they will lay eggs underneath and they just dip their rear end down and put an egg and stick it to the underside of the leaf. Now, you will see pictures of lots of eggs under a leaf, but the more common thing is one or two eggs only. And of course, when you think about it, it's common sense for the for the butterfly to do that. Think about how the monarch caterpillar eats. If she put 20 on one leaf, those kids of hers are all going to starve to death because there's not going to be enough food for them. So she'll lay one or two and then move to another plant and lay it a few more and then move to another plant and then do it again. So that's how they spread the caterpillars out and to help ensure that they will have enough to eat. Um, then, uh, when the eggs hatched it out, we're into what's called the larval stage, which most of us would call caterpillars, the longest life form. And their basic caterpillar is m just a digestive system on legs, I tell you, <laughs> that's all it is. They've got a mouth for chewing and they got a long digestive system and a couple of legs underneath and that's about it. They live to eat. Their skin is actually as hard, I mean you could squash a caterpillar, that's true, but insect wise, caterpillar size, it's a fairly tough skin trying to protect themselves from birds and lizards and things which would eat them. Obviously they're predators to them. But the problem with being a digestive system on legs and having a hard skin is that you're going to grow so big, you're going to outgrow your skin. So what happens after a while is that the skin splits down the back and the caterpillar wriggles its way out again. And they call that an instar. So the caterpillar grows out of its skin. And the first thing it does is turn around and eat the skin because it's full of nutrients, right? So they, they're very tidy and they clean up after themselves. <laughs> and boy, can they grow and can they strip a plant. We have seen that in action, haven't we, Judy, down on the, the milkweed. They will, you can see these guys have, they will strip it down. And the books will tell you that they don't kill the plant and that the plant will make more leaves. And mostly that's true, although I have lost a plant or two to too many caterpillars. So it is possible that they can <coughs> kill it, but they generally don't. So we call this molting, if you want to call it, an instar. And they can go through as many as five of these instars while they're being a caterpillar. And the caterpillar stage will last... Um, anything from five days to a couple of weeks, something like that. It varies with the species, right? But it's, it's a couple of weeks <coughs> of eating all the time, right? And then, this is, this is an example, uh, it is actually a milkweed, it's just uh, called an African milkweed. And you can see how they have stripped it completely down. And this is an example of what happens to a butterfly if there's not enough food for the thing, right? Just not enough food to grow enough to eat. So uh, the next thing this uh, caterpillar does when it gets the messages that it, it's done with the caterpillar stage, it is going to what they call pupate. A pupa is the same as the chrysalis. The word I learned as a kid is chrysalis but it's also a pupa, but it's, so it's the same thing. And caterpillars can secrete a little sort of silk or fluid out of their end, like spiders making a web, and so they will stick their, uh, their rear end onto their chosen place, and then they curl their head up, you can see he's doing it here, and then um, they will begin to change 
into this chrysalis form. I read a quote the other day that I thought was rather cool. It said, what the caterpillar says is the end of the world, the, the maker says is a, a butterfly, right? So the caterpillar may think that it's the end of the world, but guess what? It's not. And there is the chrysalis, and this is, again, is a monarch chrysalis, and he actually wriggles his caterpillar skin to the top. So he kind of chimneys and wriggles, and what's left of the caterpillar skin goes up to the top. You can see that black blob, and that helps to cement him on to whatever surface he's got. And so it helps to stick him on. And if you haven't ever had the pleasure of seeing a monarch chrysalis, oh gosh, try and get to see one. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in the world. It's a sort of lime green, and it has these little gold spots, just like somebody took a paintbrush and did little spots all the way around, and they glint in the sun. Oh my goodness, it's the most gorgeous thing. So they can go again about a week, you know, somewhere between one and two weeks in the form of, of, of a chrysalis, very vulnerable to attack by uh, predators, and of course there's no way of getting away from them if you're a chrysalis. So you lose a lot in this stage. And you're, if you ever look at a chrysalis and you can actually see butterfly wings through the outside, that means he's getting ready to hatch. Because initially you can't see anything on the inside. But a few days before, it, it, the, the skin of the chrysalis begins to thin and you can actually see like markings on wings inside. And so you know that something is about to happen. And apparently, you know the cockerel butterfly center in Houston? The man who does, who's in charge of that, um, apparently they had some research where they did MRIs and scans of the chrysalis to try and un <clears throat> understand what was going on inside. And um, it, there's a liquid. Actually, the caterpillar sort of goes into a liquid. It's like a horror movie, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then it re the cells reform themselves into the, the butterfly. Mm -hmm. And it is not clear. This is one of the wonderful things that we're not clear about this process. Nobody can say, you know, chemically, scientifically, exactly how these cells are reforming themselves, what gives the messages and so forth. I think that's kind of interesting. I like puzzles, right? We don't know. <laughs> okay, so at some point he's ready and the chrysalis splits <clears throat> and you can begin to see the butterfly and his wings come out. Now again, very vulnerable stage. In no way can that butterfly fly. He will fall to the bottom. His wings are moist, they're not fully extended, um, yet he's moving and he's got bright colors, he's going to attract birds and any other predator. So very, very vulnerable at this stage. He has to come out and then slowly, if you look at this picture, you can see a big fat body and little tiny wings, right? The big fat body is full of fluid. The wings are all shrunken. And you can, if you have a mic and you're watching carefully, you can see these rhythmic movements of the body. He pumps the fluid out of the body and down through, I guess you'd call them veins, the equivalent of veins, in his wings. So his body will become thinner and the wings will fill with fluid and stretch out to what their shape will be, which is pretty remarkable. And until all of that is completed and the wings have dried, he's not gonna be able to make it. So again, this very, very difficult stage because when he's done all this, he still has to lie there and open and close his wings for a while and let the sun dry them off. <coughs> so it's a very critical time <coughs> for the butterfly. This is an example of 
cold, wet weather. I guess we don't see too many butterflies suffering from that down here. We have plenty of wet, but not so much cold. So he wasn't able to fully extend the wings, and then they hardened when they weren't extended, so the poor thing didn't make it. This is another one who fell to the ground before his wings were dry, and he died that way. So this is um, <clears throat> this is why we need so many butterflies, right? Okay, so we have gone through <clears throat> the whole life cycle <clears throat> life cycle of this butterfly very briefly, just so that you understand what we have to keep in our minds when we're making a garden. If you're going to make a garden, you got to start with soil. You can, of course, send a soil sample off. We do that down at the extension office. They will do that, help you do that if you need to do it. But you don't have to, obviously. Some people have the heavy gumbo soil, right? The clay stuff mm -hmm. that turns into concrete. <clears throat> I have a, I come from an area where they had what they call Oxford clay. They haven't seen anything. I picked up their famous Oxford clay and it ran through my fingers. I said, are you kidding? Oh, terrible soil, can't grow anything around here. Oxford clay, I said, you don't know what you're talking about. You have met gumbo. <laughs> so it needs amending. And what you can do, of course, is dig a lot of, co of compost or something like that in. Or you may make a raised bed. That's a, that's a nice easier thing in some ways to do is to use wooden forms and make a raised bed and then you can get a whole bunch of nice new soil. You don't have to, but it's an option. And of course, if you live in uh, the south, you've got the opposite problem. You've got sand and the water goes right through it and you've got this very porous soil that doesn't hold um, nutrients or water very well. And so that needs additions too. So if you're thinking in terms of making a butterfly garden, start with the soil before you even do anything else. At least give it some thought, right? Uh, because you may need to amend it. Then, <clears throat> before we get to the habitat, you also need to think of where in your garden you want to put it. They need a sunny spot. The plants that the butterflies like the sun the plants that the butterflies want to use need the sun. So put it in a sunny spot. You need plenty of sun. Um, you also need a little shelter, a little protection from the wind. Wind makes life hard for butterflies. Uh, they can't fly against it. <clears throat> they waste a lot of calories, a lot of nutrients trying to fly against the wind and then there's not so much energy left over to egg laying and so forth. So try and get a little shelter going, like a wall, if you have it, or a fence that will block the wind a little because we do get some fairly horrific wind around here, or just a row of bushes, a couple of bushes maybe, that would do it. So think in terms of getting a little blocking of the, of the, the wind. So you want a sunny spot with reasonable soil with a little protection against the wind. And then when you get to the plants themselves, you need to think in terms of, first of all, food for the, the butterfly. In other words, nectar. Plants that produce nectar. Um, the beautiful showy annuals that you see in all the nurseries, they have nectar, but the perennials are the ones that have many more, much more nectar. So you, got, you, you need a mixture, but look for plants that have a bunch of nectar to feed the butterflies. And we'll talk about the actual plants in a minute. And then you need the plants where the the female butterflies will lay their eggs. And we said that, that, um, that a lot of them are specific. The milkweed for the monarchs. Um, who is it who likes the frog food, Judy? I forgot. Dayton and Crescent. Okay, There's the Crescent's like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of the swallowtails will like uh, dill and fennel, cabbage white, lux cabbages, uh, citrus. Somebody was saying it. Oh, the grapefruits, right? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, citrus is a big attractive for um, certain swallowtails mm -hmm. as well. So think in terms not just of nectar. They may, f they may actually take nectar from a number of plants. But when it comes to egg laying, they want a specific plant. So you've got to understand which plants are going to be necessary for each species. But it doesn't stop there. Oh, no. Um, getting some, a few stones is good. They like to bask in the sun. So having maybe a flat stone, not a jiggity jaggedy one, but a flat one that they can lie on and open and close their wings, wings that's good. They also like uh, shallow bowls like this with a little bit of water and stones in them. Um, not deep water, obviously they're going to drown in that, right? But just a little bit of water and some stones so that they can perch and drink if they are the drinking type. Um, shelter for them to get under at night uh, or if the wind picks up. So little piles of wood are good or anything like that that they could crawl under. And then this famous thing of puddling. You do see this in the country, if you're driving in the country sometimes, you'll see like a mud puddle and there'll be a whole bunch of butterflies on it. And they're, they're licking up the salts, um, sodium in particular, but probably other chemicals as well. And in particular, the males. So when you're looking at one of those puddles and lots of butterflies, they're mainly males and they do it before mating. So they must need some of these chemicals for, this, for the mating process. Mm. So it's good to have, um, have something like that. And how you can do it is to have a shallow tray, say the bottom of a, a pot, a, that the kind of tray you put a pot in, right? Something like that that's shallow, anything. And you can put some sand in there or some soil and then keep it moist. And you know, just sprinkle it with water every day so it's, it's moist and that will help. And then you can also put out sources of rotting fruit. If you take your strawberries or your bananas out of the fridge and you find they're all going black and yucky, now is the time to put them in a dish and put them out. Uh, not all butterflies are nectar only. Some of them like syrup. Okay, that they like the sugars in rotting fruit. We try and remember to do it, don't we? We sometimes forget, but we do try and remember to do that for those butterflies that like the sugars, the syrups in rotting fruit. Um, they also like things, strange things like um, uh, urine and stuff like that. They'll, they'll be getting chemicals from that, but you don't have to do anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't implying. <laughs> Just pointing it out, there's an interesting fact, okay? So uh, if you don't have access to rotting fruit in your life, then you can make <clears throat> a sugar and water syrup and soak a sponge in it. And just soak the sponge in the sugar and water and put it out. And it will be like rotting fruit, I guess. So they. Um, so it's not just, sorry, did you have a question? Yes. The rotting fruit, you just leave it out or you put it in a shallow water? Dish. No, just leave it on a dish uh, by the plants, right? Uh, on a shallow dish. The only thing to be aware of that it's not just but butterflies that like rotting fruit. <laughs> you will get other things as well, right? So, yeah. I noticed at the cockerel butterfly, they, have, they put out those, um, that you scrub your pots and pans with. Like a Brillo pad. Not, not a Brillo pad, the ones that are made out of the like plastic that's oh, yeah. colored. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know what you mean. But I don't know what they were using on them or what they were. Maybe they soaked them in something. I'm not sure, it's a while since I've been up there. I'm, I'm not sure. And, uh, but maybe they, they soaked them in either a sugar or maybe a salt or something. I don't know how you would soak them because they're plastic. It, w it, wouldn't, it would go through, wouldn't yeah, it? it wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't absorb, so. Maybe they look like, like wiping their feet. Them, so. <laughs> I don't know. I can't, yeah. We'd have to ask them about that. <coughs> so um, all of these things is, like I said, it's not just the plants. You need other things, too, that will attract them. 
And here we are looking at food sources. Here's uh, plants for the nectar. And then um, the torsho, maybe more, I don't know. At the, the bananas there. And they feed, um, they taste with their feet, and then they have what's called a proboscis, a long tongue that goes out to, to get it. Another thing to think of before you go out and buy all these plants and spend all this money is that you want to do mass plantings if possible. It, there would be a temptation for a gardener to say, I'll get one of these, and then I'll get one of these, and I'll get one of these and go put them in. But given the choice, butterflies will go to a group of plants. So if you're buying a salvia, or Rebecca or something like that, get a group of them, right? And so you have a nice clump because they seem to be attracted to that. Also, the larger butterflies like to feed higher up, this is common sense, the smaller butterflies don't like to go up so high and they like to feed lower down. So think about that as well when you choose your plants, that you want some taller ones for the high flyers and then you want some lower ones for the low ones. And obviously when it comes to planting you're going to plant the higher ones at the back and the shorter ones in the front. And let's think a little bit about some of the plants that we know about. This is uh, salvia you're looking at right there, but and you see it's a big clump of them, it's not just one plant. Uh, it says that the butterflies are attracted to red, orange, yellow, pink, lavender, blue and white. What does that leave out? I'm not sure what colors they're, what they're not attracted to, but clearly they like color, right? And bees and wasps like yellow, I do know that, so never buy a hummingbird feeder with yellow on it, right? Because the bees and wasps look up there. So you want large sweeps, that's a better way of putting it, for, but both for the look of it and for the butterflies. Uh, zinnia, we've had good luck with zinnia, haven't we? The zinnias attract a lot of butterflies, so that's one that's readily available, um, that you can you see zinnias in the big box stores very easily, and they are big butterfly attractors. And here, this is taken from our, uh, at our garden, and you can see the one that's um, a skipper, I believe, that is on the zinnia. Uh, the horse mint and lemon mint, do not forget about the herbs. There's a lot of herbs that um, butterflies like. And you have to think outside the box a little. They don't all have to be flowers. There is, this is fennel, there is a new fennel out that's called bronze fennel. And yeah, it can be cooked with, but it's a beautiful landscape plant. I just love it. I put in two or three every year, and it looks like that, only it's a sort of bronze color. And the, it's very, um, what would you call that, very airy, you know, looking. And it makes a beautiful landscape plant. So the herbs, I mean, you can... You, know, you use them for cooking, but they also make good landscape plants, and they're very good for, for the butterflies as well. And the lemon, the mints that in particular are drought tolerant. The fennel is not so drought tolerant, but and it needs a little bit of shade, not a lot. And some of these you that I've got up here, you will notice are wildflowers. There's a lot of the plants that are on the best plants left that a lot of people would call wildflowers. Oh, I don't want those in my garden. Those are weeds. Those are wildflowers. Well, those are the ones the butterflies like. And in fact, there's quite a lot of weeds that butterflies like. And what you can do about that, if you're serious about this, is to get a corner of your butterfly bed that perhaps is out of sight. Put it in a corner, put it behind the garbage pails if you want, you know. Put it somewhere where you don't want to look at those not so attractive plants and let the butterflies enjoy them and you don't have to look at them so much, right? So you could do it that way. Uh, Indian paintbrush, that's a wildflower, isn't it, as well as a 
on the Indian blanket is, but there's also a cultivated gelatia, gelatia as well. So these are mostly spring and early summer bloomers. Um, the globe amaranth, it looks like it's a relative of clover, and clover is another example of a weed. So <clears throat> let some of the clover live. Don't be pulling it out. Let it be, you know, and let the butterflies enjoy it. Because they have a lot of nectar in the clover. Uh, there's the Rudbeckia, black, black eyed Susan, I think they call that, right? Uh, that's another good one. This is sort of the top 10 of butterfly plants we're going through here. Mexican sunflower, that, another annual, good in the sun and drought tolerant. That's always handy. I don't know about gardening in Texas. It's either drought or it's downpour, right? There doesn't seem to be anything in the middle. And again, don't forget the garlic chives. Don't forget those herbs. Put them in there along with the other stuff because that's what the butterflies like. And of course, you can eat them as well. Chives are good, right? Panta is a wonder. Panta will always bring in the butterflies. It comes in many colors, that pretty red, but there are pinks and everything, and it's very easy to grow. It's cheap, it's everywhere. It's a really good butterfly plant, and it's pretty. So Panta's a good one, and you can take cuttings off it and get more yourself and pass them on to your friends. So it's very easy to grow. Porter wheat is interesting. We have porter wheat down there, yes, don't we? Do. It comes in this <clears throat> pretty purpley blue, but we also learned it comes in white, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is a white one. Oh, and the dark pink one, apparently. And it's a more tropical plant, so it's not so keen on the cold weather, but it is a perennial, so it'll come back year after year. Um, and it planted in the, in the spring, I think, is best. And it blooms all summer on and off, right? I like plants that do that. And here's our famous Asclepias, the butterfly weed or milkweed for the monarchs. And generally, when I give this talk, somebody starts asking about which type of milkweed. Right? It's a, been a big thing. I think it's dying down a bit now, but it has been for the last year a big thing online that um, the tropical milkweed, which is what we have here, uh, and is readily available in the box stores. When they, it's like an annual, and when they grow it up north, it keeps blooming, and the problem is that it keeps the monarchs up there longer because they have a food source. And then there's a sudden drop in temperature, and they can't make it south. And so there has been a lot of discussion that we should not be using the tropical milk wheat. And we should be using native milk wheats. But to be honest, native milk wheats are hard to find. You're going to find the tropical one in all the stores, okay? The native milk weeds are Asclepius texana, Asclepius incarnata, and Asclepius tuberosa. Right? So I have the names if anybody is into this, but I have to say they're hard to come by, right? And um, the tropical one is Pura Sadika. There, there's the word up there. And it's very pretty, very showy. And, but I think it's less of a problem down in Texas because it's, it's warm anyway. But you can easily get around that if you're worried about that by cutting the plants back in the fall. Mm -hmm. And that way they won't have anything to eat and they'll head south, right? So there is a way around it. But you will read a lot of stuff. Yes, sir? Uh, south, is, uh, uh, south is a relative thing. It is, you're right. Yes, so no, um, no doubt about, uh, uh, about uh, Costa Rica maybe, or what would that be, uh, Colombia and Venezuela? Way to go. But how far south? I mean, this seems pretty darn far south. To it does to me. It too. doesn't. You know, they, don't <laughs> ever own salt. they don't sell snow shovels south of Tulsa. How yeah. south is south? I can't answer that. I don't okay. know. 
Butterflies um, won't live through the winter here? Um, some do over, over winter, but the monarchs have this sort of three year you know, cycle that they go through from north to south down to Mexico and up again. There are some butterflies that only last a few months and as soon as the temperature drops they die. There are others that will overwinter and they sort of hibernate, they crawl into the wood piles and, and hibernate, so it depends on the species. What I read was that they were discovering that that tropical milkweed is not nourishing the butterflies the same as the wild. Yeah, it could be. And it's sort of kind of stunting them, not stunting them, but it's kind of making them where they're not as hardy. I read something like that too. So I think the best advice is if you can get your hand on native milkweed, that is probably your best bet. But rather than not have any milkweed at all for the monarchs, if that's what all you can get is the tropical one, then get the tropical one. To me, it would be better to have the tropical than nothing. But probably it's better if you can search it out to, um, to, to find the native ones, if you can. And we <coughs> do sell them in the sale. Uh, that we, we do sales twice a year. And when we can find them from the wholesalers, we always order them. And, and then there was the famous giant milkweed. And I don't know a lot. I know we ordered 12 or 15 of them. And the thing was like this, and it had massive leaves, the oddest looking plant you've ever seen. Not a very pretty plant, but apparently the monarchs like it just as well. So. I don't know. Yeah, get there at five minutes after nine, they were gone. <laughs> oh, did you? Oh, sorry about that. I'll order more. <laughs> Back to the milkweed. Now, my question is: they lay the eggs on the milkweed. How long does it take for the eggs to hatch? I mean, do they don't they don't overwinter on the milkweed? Apparently, then. N no, not just. It would take the eggs about sort of a week, somewhere like that, too. Oh, is that quick? Yeah, it can be me. It varies from the species, and I don't, I can't say the specific number, but but it's between one and two weeks, something oh, like from that. From the time they lay the eggs until the time yeah, they hatch. Yeah, and then they hatch out, and you will not be left in any doubt when those caterpillars start eating your milkweed. I mean, they are just amazing. <laughs> So there has been a lot of discussion and a lot of debate about these various types. So, you know, if in doubt, buy native, but buy something. So we can attract more monarchs and keep them going, right? Uh, and this is the African butterfly weed, but I have not seen that for sale anywhere. The lady who developed these slides had it in her garden, and that's why she put it on a slide. And um, she did give me some, and I managed to kill it. I want you to know that, okay? Master gardeners do kill plants, just like everybody else. Okay? But it, it was very pretty, actually. It was a pretty plant. But, and the Apparently the monarchs like it just fine, but I didn't get any seeds, so I couldn't start again. Um, the kufias, um, what are they called, cigarette, cigarette plants? Cigar, cigar plant, right? Kufia, anyway. Um, it's more like a shrub. Um, it's a very good shrub. The, there are different types of it. There's a new one called back-faced kufia with a pretty little red and black flower. Uh, a little more tricky to grow than the original one, as is often the case, but uh, it's still a drought-resistant, really good um, local plant. Uh, Roselia, you see that everywhere around here, and it comes in white as well as the orange-red. That's another really good one. And um, yet another herb, because the, the rosemary will flower if you don't need it all, right? If, so, you know, when you're growing herbs, you would often take the flowers <coughs> off to encourage more leaves. Leave them on for the butterflies, okay, because they like that. All the justicias, the justicia is a huge family, and um, the shrimp plant, most people know it at, comes in many different colors, yellow, don't know if there's a white one, but lots of yellow, pinks, and reds. 
And it's an another good <coughs> plant. It tends to get a bit sprawling and out of control, so you have to kind of trim it back because it, it's, you know, it's not a tidy plant, right? But it's a good one. Uh, here's another picture. A Philippine violet, it's just a little, little type of, of violet. That's another good one. And all the sages. Oh my goodness, there are thousands of these sages now. Um, the indigo spires was one of the original ones, but now we have um, the hot lips is a pink one, there's a red one, uh, and then the newest one is um, purpley blue, uh, black, and, black and blue it's called, or something like that. And it's really pretty, very light green leaves and very purpley, purpley flower. So all of the salvias are good, there's another salvia. Uh, and another, there's a lot of sound there, that's Greggy. And Lantana, don't be put off, Lantana. Uh, unless, I guess, you have cows. Isn't it poisonous to cows? I believe it is, right? So if you've got cows, don't grow them. But uh, Lantana comes in, there's an original pink, there's a white. Uh, I have this one, and you get red, pink, and yellow on each flower, and even though it's it needs cutting back too. You know, you have to keep it under control. It's not, the, again, a tidy plant. But the butterflies love it. It does tend to get eaten by other insects as well, so you just have to cut that part off. Um, we're going to talk about that more in just a second. But there are some newer lantanas. There's a clumping one out, which is a lot more tidy looking and it makes a, a little mound like that. So if you can find that one, it behaves a little better. And here's some more coloring of the, the lantanas. They come in heaps of colors now. The birds bring them. Sorry? The birds bring them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they they do. Uh, Leatris, um, gay feather, it's a tall plant. So put it at the back if you're going to plant it, because those purple, this slide doesn't show it so well, but it, it gets very tall, and then it tends to fall over, so, you know, uh, you need to put that at the back. It's another good nectar one as well. Uh, Duranta, it can be grown as a shrub or a small tree. Um, this one is repens, and it has the, the blue one, and it makes some nice berries. So the birds like the berries. So you're not doing just doing butterflies, you're doing birds as well. There is a new one that has a yellow leaf that I have called Cuban Gold, and it's a really good. And you can train, if you don't like untidy bushes, you just start when it's little, and you can train it up to a couple of trunks, and it makes a little tree, which is, I think, much prettier shape. Uh, all the cassias, and there's a bunch of different colors of these candlestick plants, they get called, and they're big for the sulfurs and the whites as well. Here's another cassia. Uh, this is what I call Esperanza. It's a plant with at least six names, as far as I can gather. Tacoma, I think it's its proper name, but I've always called it Esperanza. And it's a good butterfly plant too, nectar, and it flowers for a long time. Right, keeps on making new flowers. Turk's cap, not one of my favorites, but it is good for the butterflies. It's it's in the hibiscus family, the mallow family, and it does have a pretty flower, but it gets big. So don't stick it in a small bed. Find a, if you want to grow it, give it plenty of space because it gets very big. But it's extremely hardy. Camellia, of course, is the, the, what they call the hummingbird bush, but the butterflies love it too. So along with these butterflies, you're also going to get hummingbirds. And uh, it will die back when we get a cold winter, and then it comes back from the roots every year. It's very reliable, very tough, doesn't seem to have any pests that I have noticed. Uh, coral honeysuckle. Uh, have you ever seen this one? This is in the passion flower family. And it's um, the Gulf Fritillary in particular likes this one. The Fritillary we have down here is the Gulf Fritillary. We've got the long wings on it. And it makes a very pretty, mauvey-colored flower. 
and it makes these little seed pods that are really interesting too. So it's it's a neat and it's a perennial. It does like the sun. And there's this was taken from the garden, and we decided that was a fritillary, right? Caterpillar. And there he is chomping his way through the uh, <laughs> through the vine and having a good time. Uh, and here's the Dutchman's pipe vine. This is another good one. This is um, the pipe vine swallowtail, which is a great big dark colored, nearly black swallowtail. And he, she lays her eggs only on Dutchman's pipe vine. Uh, and so you will, they, they make this amazing flower. It's supposed to look like a Dutchman's pipe, but uh, it's, uh, you know, if you haven't seen too many Dutchmen smoking pipe, you might not <laughs> recognize it. But it's an amazing flower. It's a great big dot. It's a fast Dutchman's pipe. Yes, right. Uh, and it's it's a really good one. It's an active vine. It covers. If you get in the right place, it covers a lot. Yeah, it will go wild. Yeah, right. And then there is a ground color version. And we have both of these at the garden. And this is much smaller leaf, and it grows along the ground, and they'll lay their eggs on that as well. So there's the vine that goes straight up a tree or something, or a trellis, and then there's the ground cover, and they both work for the Does that one bloom? That one blooms too? Not like the other ones, well, no. Because I bought tiny. one of those. It's that's just that's tiny, that's tiny that's little bloom, Judy Because I bought one of those at the sale, and I yeah. didn't know if it actually had... I think it's one of those blooms you have to really search for, yeah, you know, know. <laughs> which is just as well, because that big flower on a... Yeah, I have the other one, too. Yeah. <laughs> you, you won't miss that flower. No, you won't. That's an amazing flower. Cypress vine, that's another climbing vine that's really good for, uh, and coral vine. I think this is they say get called Queen's Reef as well, I think, vine. And they all attract the, um, the butterflies as well. Drunk creeper, oh my goodness. That one grows wild around Texas and it's very vigorous. There is supposedly a cultivated one called Madame Galen, but it's it's also vigorous, shall we say, so don't plant it unless you've got a lot of space, but it, the butterflies do like it. And don't forget the citrus. This is a picture of a, a Maya lemon, but um, any of this, the citrus will also attract swallowtails and so forth, right? Uh, Vitex, you see that everywhere here, and that's another very tough flowering, a shrub small. And the, the canna lilies, of which there are hundreds and hundreds of types. There's dwarf, there's tall, there's dark leaves, there's light leaves, all sorts of different ones. And the skippers, I like those in particular. And here's fennel, and like I say, look for the bronze fennel. If you don't fancy fennel in a flower bed, look for the bronze one, because it's really pretty. And here are the, those would be the swallowtail caterpillars, wouldn't they? Yes. On the fennel. Ones, yeah. Eating their way, you can see there's two of them. And, well, at least I can see two, maybe there's more. And they are chomping away on the fennel. Okay, so that's a rather quick <coughs> run through of the types of plants that you can get. Now at this point, I do have to put in my little bit here. You've got, to, if you want to have a successful butterfly garden, you've got, you've got to learn to tolerate untidiness and um, a certain amount of, you've got to have a laid back approach. For instance, take the canna lilies. I don't, you know what I mean by the canna lilies. If you look at many, many canna lilies, you're going to see holes in the leaves and they get this really tacky, tatty looking leaves, right? And you think, oh, something's eating my canna lilies. I have to call the extension office and find out what to spray them with and get rid of those. Well, you're getting rid of the host plant for this caterpillar. So you've got to tolerate holes in the leaves and the little mess on the ground that they can crawl under. 
you got to stop with the pesticides, okay? What, don't ever believe a pest place that tells you that it only kills one insect. It just, you know, common sense tells you that is not true. I used to be uh, a beekeeper when I lived in Galveston, and stupid me, I had two hives by the house in Galveston, and we needed a termite treatment because it was a wooden house. And I was new to America, new to Texas, and the orchid, should say that, sorry, sorry. The man came out mm -hmm. and said, um, and I said, well, what about the beehive? He said, oh, no, it's specific to termites. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It just kills termites. So stupid me. I said, okay. And he went to, around and did his treatment, which <laughs> killed the termites. I went outside. I was going crunch, crunch, crunch on dead bees. I mean, they decimated those hives. And I called him up, not so much to complain because they were dead by then, but to point out that he shouldn't be saying that. And he came out and he agreed that there were hundreds and hundreds of dead bees on the ground. And he said, well, that's what they told me. So don't believe that. If a chemical is poisonous to an insect, it will be poisonous to all other insects, mugs. At least behave as if it will. And that includes the BT, you know, the Bacillus thuringiensis or whatever it is, the supposed, you know, the, the good guy that is supposed, we are supposed to use. But don't, you cannot be using pesticides if you want to attract insects of any kind, bees, um, all butterflies into your garden. Uh, if you if you see um, want, you know aphids or stuff like that, and you want to get rid of them, try you know hose and hose them off. That's one way. You can use soap like Dawn. Um, I have read Tabasco, right? Hot pepper sauce in the water. That maybe might disrupt them. Do all those things if you want, but, and if the branch is so heavily laden, just cut it off, you know, and get rid of it that way. <clears throat> but the pesticides, if you want to get, to get rid of other pests, you're gonna get rid of the butterfly and the <coughs> caterpillar as well. Well, what happens when the mosquito trucks come at night? Oh, well, can't do too much about that. They go so fast and just yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not that, it's like spray. Yeah, and it, it mists, you're right. Uh, I don't, I mean, I have to be honest, I like to be rid of mosquitoes as well, so I have very mixed feelings about that, right? Because it's horrible being outside with, if, if you've got clouds of mosquitoes. Um, but that's something communities have to look at. How much do you want to ban mosquitoes? How much do you want to encourage butterflies and bees? Um, it's a balance because if they don't do the mosquito spraying, then I'm quite sure they, their phone lines are you know, falling off the walls with complaints about mosquitoes. So I think it's a difficult problem and I don't, I can't, I don't have a solution except that in our own local gardens, don't add to the problem by using more pesticides, right? Perhaps we do need um, mosquito control. We could discuss that forever. But don't add to it by using more you know, pesticides. I will personally kill fire ants. I hate fire ants. Mm -hmm. But at least that's local. That probably is not going to bother your butterflies because it's a very localized thing. You know, you're putting it on the fire ant mound. Yes, sir. I, I do. Uh, I live in the fire ants unless unless they're in some very intrusive place because I'll take the fire ants over the fleas. And oh, that's true. That's true. Time. Apparently, yeah. apparently, there's not a living flea within 25 feet of a fire ant mound. They're horribly I vigorous predators. I yeah. never thought about that, but that's, I bet uh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. The and we had down at the garden, we had the crazy, um, crazy, crazy ants. ants. And they killed the fire ants. Uh, yeah, 
And then the, the crazy ants was, was such a nuisance. They were getting in all to the, the water boxes and the electrical boxes, and they yes, were so they awful that A&M came and advised us as to what, the, and they did a treatment. And it actually worked, but now we got like the fire ants back, so it's like you can't. I didn't think there was anything that they found to kill the crazy ants. You know? Yeah, they did. They have something now. Yeah, uh, I I can't tell you what they came when they're they were there. The, the beehives. They're getting in the beehives. Oh yeah. You can you can attract them to a thing that will kill them. The mosquito donuts work pretty well. Who knows if the disease has spread to other animals? Yeah. <laughs> Have a little bit of bleach in the water, they'll do the same thing too. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. When they hybridize old plants and make new ones, like the smaller variety of a hamalia that's not supposed to grow as large and just a regular hamalia, do, are they checking to see if there's as much nectar in the new species as in the old one? I can only give you my gut feeling on that, which is that the older original versions of the plants attract more butterflies or you get more butterflies on them and out of them than you do with the hybrids. But that is not a scientific opinion. I have not seen the research or done it. But my personal experience has been that the older varieties are better for the butterflies than some of the new hybridized and I think the answer is, you're right, that there is less <coughs> nectar. They're not breed, they're breeding them for color and size, showy so flowers and size, maybe size, and they're not considering the nectar issue. Mm. Um, I, but as I was say, that's not a scientific opinion, right? It's just like roses, the old roses. They yes. had the, the... And much hardier. Much and hardier. the smell. Mm -hmm. And then they bred all of that out of them. Yeah. I have a bronze spinner. Yes. And I've had it a couple, maybe three years. I have never seen uh, uh, any calendars on it. So I'm wondering. I'll bring you a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just don't know why I um, don't. I, I have the milkweed and I do. Yeah. Vermont. Not enough sun. Judy, do you have an idea? Well, it's I don't. Sun. It, it, it could be just the location. Yeah, it could be just it, it's the not. So, it gets the sun. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe plant another it host plant. It's a different kind of butterfly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Black yeah. I mean, maybe there aren't any around in your specific mm -hmm. little local area, you know, to, yes, to maybe. Yeah. yeah. Now, I would like for Judy to come and tell us a little bit about, just finish up with, uh, about our actual butterfly garden, because that's going to be a lot more, this is all theory, a lot more um, what we did, or she did, rather, and not me. So this is Judy, and then we'll do more questions. Um, I, how many of you have visited the Master Gardener Demonstration Garden uh, down at Galveston? Uh, Carbide Park. Well, uh, if you haven't been there, I would like to invite you to come visit our uh, Firefly Garden. And uh, you can visit the demo garden. It's called Discovery Garden, Discovery Garden now. And it's uh, open to the public on Thursdays. So you can come any Thursday. If you come the first Thursday in the month, uh, we have guided tours. So uh, we'd be happy to have people walk around and talk yes. about the whole garden. It's in the mark. Come on, Carbide Park. It's at Carbide Park. Um, Y'all still have Highway 3 on there, though. It's, oh, it's, so I do. Oh, that, that's how <laughs> I how, never noticed that. that is. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. I need to change it. It's the old uh, address. In, in 2013, um, I visited uh, the Master Gardener Conference in South Texas. And while I was down there, um, I went on a tour to see community gardens, and one of the ones I saw was the Master Gardener Educational Garden in South Texas, and they had a beautiful um, butterfly garden down there. And it was kind of the inspiration for us to do our butterfly garden. And fortunately, on that trip was one of our vice presidents, 
in our local chapter, and he saw that same butterfly garden. So when I came home and started talking about him in the butterfly garden, he gave me a lot of support and was one of the instrumental people involved in making sure that we got the Master Gardener Butterfly Garden going. So in 2014, um, the board approved the, the garden and uh, told us to go ahead. But the difficult part of that was they didn't give us any funding. So we were allowed to move ahead with our garden as long as we could use material there for the master gardeners um, to use in the garden. And one of the most important things for, that we were able to use was to have Tish as our designer and our resource as we developed the garden. And uh, where the guys probably would have preferred for us to have a, a nice straight bed, uh, square bed probably, or a rectangle bed with straight lines, Tish was there to say, you know, we might need some curvy lines for our butterflies. And we don't want it to just be a straight line. We want it to have some flow to it. Now that might not be important to a butterfly, but it certainly makes it more attractive than the environment. And we have a, 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 a nice size butterfly garden that's very much like a semicircle. Um, and it has, in the center is a walking area and we have a couple of benches. And the beds I think are about eight feet wide, yeah. six to eight feet yeah. wide. Yeah. And um, as you uh, approach the gardens, um, you see trellises that uh, kind of frame the bamboo in our serenity garden behind it. So it's a beautiful garden to see as you approach it. Uh, but when we started building it, it was just a flat, grassy area. And of course, we had to go in and do the circle marking, which Tish did. And so we got it laid out. We brought in the dirt the soil, because we have soil available to all of our gardeners there, and we built up our raised beds and we added mulch, and then we came along and we lined it with ledge stone, and I don't know if you're familiar with ledge stone, but it's about uh, 12 inches wide, or 10, 12 inches long, and it's kind of four by four, and it uh, is a nice flat surface, so it was a nice retaining area where our raised bed. And uh, what's also good about that is it's a nice sunny place for butterflies when they want to just rest for a while. And in the center, Tish designed our garden so we would have a bee hotel. And people probably wonder, well, what's a bee hotel doing there? But it was really clever. We had a, a man who was uh, very artistic and he did a butterfly shape Bee Hotel, and the Bee Hotel is made from some of our own bamboo, and it actually attracts the solitary bees, which are very good um, sources of uh, nectar pollinators, so uh, we are glad to have that available. So she was not only thinking of butterflies when she designed our garden, she was thinking of other pollinators. Um, and but let's see, we've got the rocks that uh, hold all of our soil in, but we also made benches out of those same same rocks, so we wouldn't have to spend any money. So we used rocks and we used soil and we used mulch, all available to the master gardeners there at the garden. And we made progress to the point where it was time to, to plant. So we sent out a call to uh, master gardeners, and fortunately many of them came through with donated plants. So in the beginning, our garden was started with all the donations from the master gardeners. And we have uh, many of the plants that Tish recommended, and probably not by design. Uh, we have drifts of uh, Black Eyed Susans, and we have drifts of Salvia. Uh, not because we, we planted it that way, but because they multiplied since then and have created their own drifts. And have missed flower. And um, we do have one groups of plants in different areas, uh, but that's okay. Uh, that's uh, kind of showcasing those particular plants. 
and the butterflies can still fly through and see all of the other uh, large groupings that they may like. And uh, we like to use as many natives as we can as we're getting more mature and we're replacing some of the plants that, that don't survive through the winter or um, for other reasons, we're moving towards more native plants. And one of the native plants that I really like is um, the one that she mentioned, the gay feather, the prairie, old, old prairie plant. And it's truly beautiful and um, I encourage all of you to add it to your garden if you have a, a special place for um, a plant that kind of grows tall and blooms uh, late in summer and into the fall. It's got a beautiful purple flower on it. Dies back in the winter, but it, it comes back in the, the spring and starts all over again. And that's a beautiful plant to have. And another one that we grow, the uh, frog fruit, which is a, it's a little um, uh, ground cover. And you may think it's a weed. You may even have it growing in, in your yard and you're constantly pulling it out because you don't think it's anything important. But it's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice little kind of well-behaved ground cover. And it has pretty little tiny white um, uh, flowers on the outside, but it has a little purple center. And it, it will just kind of fill up with uh, white flowers and the purple center. And it attracts three different kinds of butterflies. So it's, it's a nice plant to have. And it's pretty manageable for a ground cover. Uh, it, it will pretty much stay where you want it to stay. And it's easily maintained uh, just by trimming off these, these little uh, uh, sections that get out of bounds. So it's not hard to, to uh, uh, keep up with. And it's called frog fruit. Frog fruit. Frog fruit. And she also mentioned uh, zinnias. And I want to encourage you to grow zinnias. This is probably the cheapest plant you can grow. And you can grow it from seeds. And $1.28 uh, will get you a whole drift of color uh, for, your, for your butterflies. And it's not only good for your butterflies, it's beautiful to look out there and see those, those plants of lots of color and, and pretty shapes and, and um, just going all through the summer heat. And I, they're special to me because I think back to my grandmothers. They, they grew zinnias and here we are in the 21st century and I'm growing zinnias too. So it's one of those plants that you just don't go out of style with. And it, it's the best bargain around, I think. <laughs> you always get a mixture of colors. Uh, from something like that, or are you picky? I don't think they're picky. Uh, you can you can no, get I mean, can you a packages? You can get just red. You can get just red. Yellow. You can just get purple. Mm -hmm. uh, they sell uh, zinnias in all kinds of combinations: big ones, little ones. I mean, Rose, I mean, it has no smell. Uh, no, I don't but, think so. But everything that flies around. Like but I'm so <laughs> glad you brought that up because <laughs> that's why uh, we have herbs. Uh, now, Tish talked about herbs, and I always like to encourage people to include herbs in their garden. Now, we talked about uh, butterfly garden. You don't have to have a great big butterfly garden. You can just take where you have your nectar plants already growing and add in some of these plants that are butterfly specific, and you will probably start seeing the butterflies come to your garden. And as as endangered as butterflies are, I like to encourage people to go out of their way to add a little for the butterflies in their garden. Because we all need to be bringing the butterflies uh, to our gardens and protect them. Because development is all around us. And pretty soon, if we don't have things growing in our garden to attract the butterflies, we're just not going to have butterflies coming our way. So. Think, think about what you can do to add uh, butterfly plants to your garden. I know one of the gentlemen said he was going to uh, be building a, a butterfly garden. So I hope he will get some ideas for plants to use. But I'm going to just pass these around because this is basil and this is Florence. And just smell how fresh they are. 
and how nice um, it is to have these plants. And you can not only share them with butterflies, but you can eat them also. So that makes them extra special. And she mentioned rosemary, and um, uh, basil is great, fennel is great, dill is great, and they all smell good, and they um, are good for the butterflies, so keep that in mind. And I just want to mention one book to you before uh, I see Tisha has brought the names up, and I'll show up. But uh, if you need more information about butterflies, this was written by, it's called Butterfly Gardening for Texas. And it's written by, her name is Gayata, and I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name. And um, if you see that name, you might not think that she's a Native American, but she's a Cherokee. Uh, who grew up in Oklahoma and moved to Texas, and uh, she is considered one of the authorities on Texas butterflies. And besides being um, a well-written book, it's beautiful, it could be a coffee table book, and it has so much information in here about plants and butterflies. So it's a good resource for, for you all to think about. And the library has brought out books over here. Uh, that they have available for resources, and we have some books over here that, that Tisha and I have brought, so you might want to keep uh, take a look at those after the program. Uh, and now, I think it's time to do our drawings. I'm getting hints from Tish. No, you know. <laughs> Were there any questions? Oh, one thing I forgot to mention was our vines, and I'm sorry, uh, I'll get to your question in just a minute, but we, we, had, um, uh, we have vines that are very specific for butterflies. Some butterflies prefer uh, vines that grow upright, as she mentioned, and we, we have about four different vines that we've included, uh, passion flower and the cape, uh, coral honeysuckle, and um, we have another one, the coral vine that she mentioned. Uh, so, there are several vines that are great for butterflies and other pollinators, so I include, uh, you know, encourage you, if you're going to have a butterfly garden, don't just think about what grow, uh, grows low on the ground, think about something that will grow upright and maybe consider a trellis. Oh, well, beyond, uh, <clears throat> my scope of, uh, of uh, reference ends at Home Depot and uh, mm -hmm. failing generous donations, where do you get a lot of these unusual native plants? The native plants, yeah. um, you can get some at, um, well, ha have you ever been to Ma's Nursery? No, Seabrook. Wow. It's Seabrook. Seabrook. Yeah. That, that's Seabrook. a great place. Joshua's and uh, there's all these For wonderful nurseries downtown. And uh, I think there's even one out towards Alvin called Joseph's. Yeah, Joseph's in Paraland. In Paraland? Buchanan's in the Heights. Yeah, Joshua's in Buchanan in Highway 35. They have some. Tom Thumb in Galveston. And there's also a website for the Native Plants uh, Society, and you can check there for Native Plants. And they also have, they uh, have formed a new chapter uh, in the Clear Lake area that meets next Monday night <laughs> at the University of Houston Clear Lake. You don't have to do anything, because for winter, what do they do? They just, because like if they bury in the ground, you don't want to disrupt the soil, or what do they do for the winter, the butterflies? Well, you know, we have such a, a warm winter that you can see butterflies mm -hmm. practically year-round, but as she mentioned, you know, they're temperature, temperature sensitive, so they, if they're not hibernating and go, or going south, um, I think they're probably not around. Right. It, it depends on the species, but they can overwinter. Some of them can overwinter. They can go through a, a cold winter. That's my question is, are they in the ground, so you don't want to They go them? into like piles of wood or bits of tree, you know, fall, fallen logs, those kind of things, apparently. You're not going to see them, I don't think. And Why? Then, but it's like a hibernation. Okay. But I mean, I you don't throw it out if you have like some wood. Oh, maybe they're hibernating in there. So yeah, that, that's in, that's why I said, don't be too tidy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question? Yes. Um, if you have a garden with vegetables, uh, tomatoes, uh, 
zucchini, that kind of thing, and you have a butterfly garden also, will they leave the, the food plants alone? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Uh, what can we do? Well, I just wondered I if the know. gardens were separated distance-wise. It might be it might be better to separate them a little, I guess, because do you use pesticides on your vegetables at all? It's my husband's garden. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know You'd have to think about that because yeah. some people who grow tomatoes or something might spray the tomatoes, right, for something. Mm -hmm. what, the tomato hornworm or whatever it is, right? Uh, I'm not a vegetable person myself, but otherwise you would just have to let it all grow grow together. <clears throat> you could grow, um, there are plants that you grow like nasturtiums and marigolds that you plant between the vegetables mm -hmm. that are sacrificial to the caterpillars, so you could try that, yeah. right? Okay. And attract them in between the rows of vegetables so that they eat what they're supposed to eat. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> are there any other questions? Well, let's, we're gonna give away some plants. And we, yeah. have, we have a variety, we have a couple of herbs, uh, we have a couple of natives, and then we have a uh, salvia, so.